All right, let's go ahead and get started and then we will make sure we are out of here right on time. I wanted just to give you a couple of things as you're preparing tonight for your closing argument. I wanted to give you a few things to think about. What we have seen over the years as we've watched you all do closing arguments is we've seen that many of you do wonderful opening statements in closing and wonderful closings in opening. I know that many of you were told too much argument in opening and many of you are going to be told, I will bet, uh, you know, it sounded pretty much like an opening. So I want to give you a few things to watch as we watch this demonstration to help you think about what you're doing and what you're doing differently in closing than what you do in opening. I would suggest to you that what you're doing with closing is more like jazz and what you're doing in opening is more like a, well, a country western song, right? So jazz, as you know, has this structure to it and uh, what makes it interesting is that the structure varies from time to time and I want to talk to you about a couple ways to vary that structure but also have you pay attention to how that theme gets played the first time in a very nice and clear, simple way, and it's from that theme that the variations play off of it. And to look at tone then, theme, structure, what the jazz aficionados call antitheme, anticipating what the next time is that it's going to play, or in our case, what the opposing counsel is going to say, anticipating the arguments from the opposing side. And one of the, one of the things you need to realize is that there is an opportunity in our structure for the state to do a rebuttal. So you need to realize that there's not going to be the last word when the closer gets done for the defense. And you're going to have to think about strategically what do we do with the rebuttal anti-theme and how does the defendant still keep people on their side when the closer for the prosecution still talks. And then, as you know, good jazz has a rousing finish. So we want to make sure that you're ready for the finish. So let me just give you a couple really quick tips through this tone. Sincerely, sincere and appropriately dramatic. Folks are conditioned by, in the U.S. in particular, about drama, and they have seen closing arguments, and so they're expecting a little more drama. It's not quite as conversational. There's going to be more room for storytelling, more room for analogies. It's time to be a little more dramatic as you talk to folks. And now is the time to argue. Now is the time to argue. And I want to say a little bit more ex about exactly what that means. For public speaking, let me suggest to you that argument does not necessarily always need to sound and look like argument. In fact, one of the temptations is that you end up yelling at the jury and the jury feels yelled at. Why are you yelling at me? Aren't you angry at the other side? So what you want to do is to recognize that as you bring that drama, that you direct your emotion and your passion against the opponent as opposed at the jury. In addition, if it's true, what we've been talking to you about is that the maximum persuasion occurs when the jury arrives at the decision or the finding for themselves then what is absolutely necessary in the closing are places where instead of you telling them what to think, you might ask them what's fair. And so we're going to look at what you do with tone is make arguments certainly and tell them what you think the, the case means, but you may finally leave some of the key things for them to conclude for themselves. We'll look at this facts leading to inference, and now is the time to say, and therefore, Megan Lee, she got the person wrong. She recognized that person in the photograph, but she didn't recognize the person out there that night. To say what your theory is on the misidentification, not just juxtapose it, but to go ahead and tell the jury what it means. Law to facts, facts to law is what you're going to be looking for. Watch these folks, how beautifully they match facts and law. Your themes, you all know there are all these wonderful themes out there in the trial world. Um, many of you may feel like they're kind of corny, you know, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit, right? Uh, the glove kinds of things, rush to judgment, king was in control. These are phrases that I encourage you to play. Try, try a phrase as a theme. 
and then do like good jazz, which is to weave that theme in and repeat it in order for the jury really to understand how you feel like it puts it all together. If the shoe fits, after all, the physical evidence tells us the story. Okay? So, the analytical structure of a closing, then, has these features to it. It gives you permission, the court can give, is given, giving you permission to use jury instructions, to weave the jury instructions specifically at times where it's appropriate in helping the jury understand what's going on. And so, you know, if you have an alibi defense, and you want to make sure that you, have, you don't have now the burden of proving it, you may take the alibi defense out and show the jury in closing argument that the presumption of innocence stays even though you're taking on this alibi. It doesn't mean you have to prove it all, but it has to raise a reasonable doubt. And the jury instruction will tell you that, and it's time now to match, then, the jury instruction with some of the things that you're saying. This is one of the favorites for trial lawyers, direct and circumstantial evidence. It's really important because jurors, this is counterintuitive to them. They think that direct evidence is better than circumstantial evidence. But in fact, the jury instruction tells them that the law makes no distinction, that the jury is supposed to take all the evidence together to decide whether or not, in fact, the proof has been met or not. So use jury instructions, use the verdict form, Show them what you want them to do. And when you're thinking about the hierarchy of persuasion, watch these folks as they look at categories of evidence. It's not a chronological story now that repeats what they've proven. What they're doing is they're categorizing according to admissions, physical evidence, eyewitness evidence, dueling banjos on the eyewitnesses, circumstantial evidence, and what it tells them. And they use analogies and common sense. These are all then parts or pieces of an argument that you weave together. And right, remember this, these analogies are the kinds of things then that really help the jury understand. Members of the jury, what is reasonable doubt? If you have a cat and a mouse and you put them in a box, and you open the box and the mouse is gone and there's a hole in the bottom of the box just big enough for the mouse to get out of, then you have a doubt. A doubt about whether or not the cat ate the mouse. But if you look at the cat and you see in the cat's mouth the mouse's tail, then even though there may be a hole in the mouse, you've got a tail that tells us that the cat ate the mouse. And those kinds of analogies or other analogies that you will hear help the jury understand what it means to say you might have a doubt about one thing in the case, but you don't have a doubt about the case as a whole because of other facts that counter that. Your, your experts can often help you and supply you with analogies in given cases. The rule about analogies as you are trying them out is that they have to be ones you can tell. They have to be appropriate for you. They have to be something that can't be turned too easily by your opponent. All right, so think about that. If I use that analogy, what is it that somebody like Liz Markowitz is gonna do with that? Or what is it that, that, uh, that a good prosecutor like Matt McCoy is gonna do with that analogy? And how is that gonna be changed and twisted? All right, so you want to pay attention to the analogies. They can be very persuasive, but you've got to be careful about how they can be turned. So you put it all together. Often you preview it by saying these are the issues that you're going to address. It's nice if they match the opening statement, right? The end of the opening statement, those questions that you left the jury. So you and your partner get together and say, can we do a bridge between the two? I think of these two mnemonics, crack, all right? Conclusion, rule, analysis, and conclusion. You tell them what your conclusion is, you, you talk to them about the rule, you stack the facts, and you repeat your conclusion. The problem with that is it starts to sound like you're yelling them at them at some point. And so if a rack is a, a variation of it, well, the issue is whether or not Megan Lee did, in fact, identify 
the person who robbed her on that night when she looked at that second array of photos. The facts are, though, that she'd seen that picture before. But remember, she had never seen, she'd never said she'd seen anything about the goatee. She never mentioned the goatee when the police officer asked. She never mentioned a goatee until after she identified him the second time. Let's look at that second photograph. Are there any of the other people who are shown that have goatees? Members of the jury, the mind is a tricky thing. Recognition is tricky. When did I see that person before? When did I see that goatee before? The issue for you, members of the jury, is whether or not, in fact, Megan Lee saw a goatee before or whether she, in fact, saw the same goatee in the same picture that showed up in both places. And the question is whether or not there's doubt in your mind from that juxtaposition of those two pictures. Misidentification, we know what happens all the time. How many times have you run up to somebody and said, hey, Joe, and realized it was the wrong person. Misidentification happens all the time. We make assumptions, we jump. And so you stack the issue facts with the rule, a jury instruction, with an analogy, and then with a question. And it gives a variation to your argument that gives room for the for the jury to make some conclusions. And again, watch how these folks will vary the argument structure. We do need to be careful, if you are the prosecutor, no sandbagging. Rebuttal is rebuttal. You don't save arguments for the end that you haven't made before. Rebuttal has got to be rebuttal, so watch out for that. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention to you about closing. It is time for you to reenact key moments during the trial, things that occurred in the trial where you asked questions and you got answers. And it's time now for you to say, remember when I asked? Remember when I asked Megan Lee this question? To reenact it and make it live and use the exhibits for emphasis and then big finish. And your big finish is to tell them plainly what it is that you want them to do. All right? In your normative guide, you have a kind of template that will help you brainstorm tonight through the closing and give it that structure that you're looking for. So you might check that out. Now I want you to watch these great closings. And the beauty of trial work is you can steal. All right? You don't need to attribute this. You can steal these things if they work, if they work for you. And I encourage you to take advantage, full advantage of what we're going to see. So we start with the prosecution. Matt McCoy for the prosecution. We've got to ratchet back away from our case, um, the Malik case, and back to the Van Sustem case. So they're going to talk to you about closings in the Van Sustem case. Let me get your, uh, your slides up. OK? OK. Members of the jury, counsel may now address you with their closing arguments. Please, if you would, give them your complete attention. Counsel? Rich people lie. Famous people lie. Nancy Van Susten lies. On paper, Nancy Van Susten lied. In person, Nancy Van Susten lied. To the police, Nancy Van Susten lied. When Nancy Van Susten altered her calendar, she lied. 
when Nancy Van Susten spoke to the FBI, she lied. When Nancy Van Susten came here and testified to you, she lied. The judge is going to tell you what the law is in this case that you have to apply to the facts that you find. And the judge is going to tell you what the substantive charge is against Ms. Van Susten. If I could have slide 201. And the technical language that I expect the judge to read to you is going to be this, false statement to a government agency, the crime of making a false material statement in a matter within the jurisdiction of a governmental agency, as charged in the indictment, has three essential elements, which are, one, the defendant knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally made a false statement concerning a matter within the jurisdiction of the Securities of Exchange Commission. Two, the statement was material to the SEC. And three, the statement made to the FBI was a matter within the jurisdiction of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, that is a lot of legal language. That means you can't lie to the FBI about something they care about. Okay? That's all that means. It's that simple. And that's what Ms. Van Susten did. The FBI wasn't there to ask her about her next show. They were there to ask her about the trades that had gone on and whether or not she had a stop order. Okay? and she lied to them. Let's talk about the lies that Ms. Van Susten committed. If I could have slide 160. This is Exhibit 3A. You'll remember the testimony about that, and you'll remember that here on the 27th, Ms. Van Susten admitted that she changed the entry to show just that Mr. Bacchino's office had called, not what they had called about. If I could have 161. She was hiding that it was kin life, trading downward. That is a lie and it is evidence of her guilty conscience. If I could see slide 172. Ms. Van Susten was interviewed by the FBI. And in the interview with the FBI... Is that the right one? No, sir. 172? 172 should be exhibit 10. Yes, thank you. So this is an excerpt from the interview between the FBI and Ms. Van Susten. And the part of the lie is the bottom government. So you had a stop order in place, Ms. Van Susten. Yes, that is the lie. That is where Ms. Van Susten lied to the FBI about something that they cared about. How do we know it's a lie? It's simple. Slide 177, please. 177. Sorry, it would be Exhibit 11. You'll remember about the blue sheet. You'll remember that when there's a trade, automatically, and as a matter of 
requirement by the SEC, there's a blue sheet generated. And the blue sheet contains the pertinent information about the trade. And there was a blue sheet generated about this trade. And the blue sheet has a spot on it for pursuant to stop loss order. And it's checked if it's made pursuant to a stop loss order. It's not checked if it's not made pursuant to a stop loss order. And this, Exhibit 11, is the blue sheet for the sale in question. And as you will remember, and as you can see, there is no check because there was no stop loss order in place. And so that is the lie to the FBI about something they cared about. If I could have slide 196. The judge is also going to instruct you. The judge is going to tell you about what the burden is that the state carries. The judge is going to tell you that the state has the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's all the burden the state has. The judge is not going to tell you that the state has to prove its case beyond all possible doubt. The judge is not going to tell you the state has to prove its case to a mathematical certainty or to a scientific certainty. You're not going to hear the judge say that the state has to prove its case beyond any possible doubt. The state's burden is to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's all. And that's what we've done. My esteemed counsel, Ms. Markowitz, wants you to believe that this woman, Nancy Van Susten, a media star, a highly educated woman, a lawyer, a former law professor, a former prosecutor, and a registered securities broker made a mistake when she told the FBI that there was a stock order in place. That's so much garbage just garbage. And you've heard the phrase, the saying, garbage in, garbage out. In this case, the defendant lied when she altered her calendar. She lied when she spoke to the FBI. She lied when she testified here in front of you. Garbage in, garbage out. The garbage in this case is sitting right there. And it's time for you to take the garbage out. <laughs> Return a verdict of guilty. Oh my God, I have to know. Okay? Okay. I am not my broker's keeper. And Nancy Van Sustrom was not her broker's keeper. 
Nancy Van Sustrom hired Frank Bocino as her stockbroker. She invested millions of dollars with him over the course of their seven-year investment relationship. And what, in turn, did Frank Bocino give Nancy Van Sustrom? Poor customer service. As her broker, Frank Bocino owed her the duty of buying and selling stocks at her request and following up appropriately with paperwork. And while they might have had a friendship outside of their business relationship, at the end of the day, it was a business relationship. And the fact that after December 21st, after their conversation about putting in an at 60 stop loss order on the King Life shares, he fails to follow the appropriate paperwork is not Nancy Van Sustrom's fault, and nor should it be her problem. As a customer, how is the government now blaming her for the inactions of her broker? That would be like the government coming after me if my doctor files fraudulent Medicaid bills. How's that my problem? At the end of the day, Nancy Van Sustrom and Frank Bacino had a business relationship. And Nancy had agreed on December 21st that if the King Life shares went below 60 a share, sell. Just call me and let me know. And the evidence will sh has shown you that that's exactly what was in Nancy Van Sustrom's mind. This was a formal order. The government is making this case much more complicated because they know they cannot prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. This case is only about whether she lied. And you've heard the evidence, and you know she did not. As I told you in the beginning of this case, the only important issue that you should be concerned with is what was communicated to Nancy Van Sustrom on the day of her sales, and was a stop order in place? And you know the answer was she knew she was told the sale was going, the stock was going down, and she knew the stock or stop loss order was being put in place. The question is, did Nancy Van Sustrom believe the stop loss order was in place if the shares went below 60? So when you go back into the jury room, the only questions you have to answer that the state has to show you beyond a reasonable doubt. Did Nancy Van Sustrom lie when she told investigators she believed there was a stop loss order at 60 and whether or not the phone call contained any non-public information? It's not what is in the mind of Frank Pacino. It is not what De Deborah Farrell thought. It is what Nancy Van Sustrom believed. The judge is going to instruct you about the law, and I want to go over just a few concepts. The first is the presumption of innocence. Nancy sits here presumed innocent, unless or until the state has proven this case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I would submit to you that they have not done that. And so she remains innocent, because she is. What is reasonable doubt? Reasonable doubt is just that. It is a doubt for which you can attach a reason, and you must acquit. It's not a vague doubt. It's not an arbitrary doubt. It's one that you can say, I'm not sure the government proved the case because. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk about the becauses. I want to talk to you about circumstantial evidence. 
Circumstantial evidence excludes every other reasonable hypothesis except the guilt of the defendant, in this case, Nancy. So the fact that the government says that there was no stop loss order exclude the reasonable hypothesis, which is Nancy having had a conversation on December 2nd with Frank Bocino and not really ready at that point to commit to, let's put an end to whatever bleeding I'm having off of this stock. Remember, she's already lost 15 to 20 percent on this stock. She bought at 74. This stock has been steadily declining. But if she believed, based on the conversation on the 21st, he had finally convinced her on the 21st, on their phone conversation, Nancy, we got to cut our losses. Take it as a capital loss to offset the rest of your gains. The moment she said yes to him was the moment she believed the stop loss order was formal. Whether Frank thought it was formal or not doesn't really matter. It's Nancy. A good broker will inform his client when stocks are going down. And in this case, that is what happened. When Frank, because he was on vacation, couldn't get in touch with Nancy because she was on vacation, he told Deborah Farrell, give her a call, let her know, stock's going down. And so Deborah does. And when it hits below 60, she says sell. Nancy is a sophisticated client. And I would suggest to you that because she is a sophisticated client, because of her experiences, she's not worried about whether Frank is sending her paperwork. She's trusting him to do the job that he was hired for. He didn't work for her for free. He made money off of her. And the fact that she had an understanding with him and he drops the ball is not her responsibility and the government shouldn't be holding her liable. Just because she didn't get paperwork doesn't mean she's lying. And the fact that the government stands her and says to you, she lied, she lied, she lied, she lied, they can say it a hundred times. They can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And for that, you have to acquit. Let's talk about credibility of the witnesses. This is an important part. In determining the credibility of the witnesses, the judge will tell you that you may take into account their interest, their bias, or their prejudice, and any other factors that would bear on the believability and weight of the witness's credibility. The witnesses that the government is relying on to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt are not credible. There are three witnesses, witness categories in most cases. You have your lay witnesses. These are civilian witnesses. You have law enforcement. And you have your scientific witnesses. And in this case, the government brought you Deborah Farrell, Special Agent O'Connell, and Joseph Abraham. So let's talk about Special Agent O'Connell. She's a law enforcement witness. And she has somewhat of an interest in this case. She's the investigator. She is the one who gathered the information and presented it to the government. And so she doesn't want to be told, you did a poor job. But why did they call the investigator? They called the investigator because she sets the stage. She has no independent information other than the gathering of the witnesses. The most that she can say is that when she spoke to Nancy, over the course of the investigation, Nancy gave inconsistencies. Yes, Nancy gave inconsistencies. She was inconsistent about who she talked to not about what was said to her, and not about whether there was an at 60 stop loss order. That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason.
Special Agent O'Connell had to admit that during cross-examination. But Special Agent O'Connell told you a very interesting thing. She told you that once they got an alert about the King Life shares, everybody, everybody, every broker, every buyer became a target. And who was her favorite target? Yikes. Deborah Farrell. Deborah Farrell is her star target. Yet, Special Agent O'Connell has to admit that Deborah Farrell lied to her on more than one occasion. Deborah Farrell originally said she was just following orders when she sold and dumped all the King Locks stock. Okay, so she's implicated herself in a crime, but she's going to stay as their star target and their star witness. That's okay. Then she had to admit that she did speak to Nancy. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. First she said she never spoke to Nancy. Then she says, oh wait, yeah, I did. But all I told her was, there was an at, I told Nancy we're selling your stock at the at 60 stop loss order. When Frank had called Deborah to tell her to call Nancy. And then she comes in with a completely different story. And now she's claiming that she revealed non-public information. Again, admitting to another crime, their star witness. Crime, their star witness. Don't forget, Deborah Farrell is a licensed stockbroker who has already admitted before they start anything that she's committed a federal crime. So what has a Special Agent O'Connell added to help you determine whether the state has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt? Nothing. More importantly, they've given you a doubt for which you can attach a reason. So let's talk about the lay witness. As a category, these witnesses have the most personal interest in the case, and Deborah Farrell is no exception. They call Deborah Farrell because she's the only one they have who is going to say that Nancy knew about the King Locks dumping of their stock and that she believed, she, she Deborah, didn't realize there was a stop at, a, at 60 stop loss order. But what's her personal interest? Well, you all heard what her personal interest is. She's got a vendetta. She's got an agenda. Her original testimony, when not that the SEC and FBI are nipping at her heels, when they got a full-on grab, when she's already admitted to a crime, they ask her about Nancy. This is a 25-year-old woman who came and told you, I needed my job. Really? Because don't you think she would have done anything and said anything at that moment had she had anything that would have helped the government? And you know the answer to that question is yes. Exhibit 11 that this government brought you. What Mr. McCoy wants to talk about now, which is the failure to check off pursuant to the stop loss order. You heard about what stop loss orders are. When the appropriate paperwork is put in, it would be activated, and that box would be checked off. Had trade authorized by Frank Bacino been there, he would have done that. He would have checked it off because he had personal knowledge. He had the conversation with Nancy Van Susterm on December 21st when she agreed to put it in place. It wasn't Deborah Farrell. That's a red herring. That's to throw you off. Don't be thrown off. 
How do we know she's lying, other than the fact that she would have sung like a canary? What's that phrase? Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned? It's not until Frank Bacchino refuses to leave his wife and dumps her that she changes her story. Don't forget, this is a woman who had an affair. She has no problem in deceiving people, in hiding things from people, in being secretive. Do you really think she just developed a conscious? With Special Agent O'Connell, Deborah didn't want to talk. And when she finally does, she tells O'Connell originally that I gave her the courtesy call as Frank Bacchino told me, told her the, stop, uh, the at 60 stop loss order was being put in place. But the fact that Frank tells her on the phone, because you know how this conversation's going. Deborah Farrell calls him and says, oh my God, King Lock are jumping their stock, what do I do? And he says, sell. And he says, call Nancy, tell her stock's going down, sell. The at stop loss order's in place. The fact that Deborah thinks it's informal now doesn't matter. Again, it's what Nancy thought. So what has five minutes? Okay. So what has Deborah added? Nothing. In fact, her testimony shows you there's even more doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. So let's talk about the scientific evidence because that's why they brought in Mr. Abraham, their expert. Normally, these people are supposed to be credible. They're supposed to have expertise. They're supposed to follow scientific methodology that's accepted by their peers. They brought in Abraham to do one thing, to say that the At 60 was not written on December 2nd in the investment planning log. Oh, okay. Y'all could have done that yourself. Because on December 2nd, Nancy hadn't agreed to that, had she? It wasn't until the 21st. Well, he better say it wasn't on the 2nd. But what does he go further? Because the, he has to say, the only reason they bring him in is to say that the At 60 had to have been placed in January. And you already heard that the treatises tell you People in his field, real experts say, the information that he gave you could not have been gotten by proper method. In other words, he's just making it up. Because anything under five weeks, you can't tell. But one more important thing about this expert. The government wants to say to you, don't worry about Frank, I mean Joseph Abraham, don't worry about the fact that he perjured himself. Just ignore that, because he's a really good witness. That is a doubt for which you can attach, and attach a reason, and you must acquit. So what do we do with him? What does that leave you? With any evidence left? No. Zero that the state has to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. You may not like Nancy Van Sustrom, and that's okay. You may not like the fame she had, and you may not like the fact that she changed her calendar, but she changed it back. So again, another red herring. You may think that Nancy did it, and if that's how you feel, then you are required to return a verdict of not guilty, because thinking and feeling is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm going to leave you with a final, two final thoughts. The first of which is, think about this. 
As a result of O'Connell, Deborah, Frank, and Jonathan Abraham. Two months ago, the government security fraud case was dismissed against Nancy Van Sestrom. This is the last time that I'm going to be able to talk to you. And so if I forget anything, if I didn't tell you all the details, you go back and talk about it in the jury room. It's your collective thoughts. Object for me when Mr. McCoy gets back up here and says things that you know are not true. Let's talk one more time about reasonable doubt. It's a doubt that would cause people to hesitate in the most important of their affairs. It's the amount of proof that you would need before you make a big life decision. Some people like to talk about big life decisions, marriage. But you can change that. Lots of people get divorced. Buy a house. You can sell a house. Lots of people do that. But jumping out of a plane, you can't undo. So what if this was the kind of information that you had before making that decision? You go to the airport. You're nervous. You're not sure if you're going to jump. You go into a room where they show you videos. And you're feeling a little better. You read about the procedures how the plane is maintained, how the parachute is packed, how you're going to jump tandem with somebody with experience. And you're feeling more confident, and so you get on the plane, and you're up at 10,000 feet. And you're standing, they open the door, and you're standing there, feet right at the edge, wind blowing so hard you can hardly hear. They let you know a few more things. Hey, Deborah Farrell. She packed your parachute. You ready to jump? And then they tell you, Jonathan Abraham, he's going to jump tandem with you. He'll get you down safely. And oh, by the way, he's the one that wrote the procedures about safety. You going to jump? No. No one in their right mind would jump with information from those two. And if you wouldn't jump, then don't make my client, Nancy Van Susten, jump. It's that simple. It's reasonable doubt, and you must acquit. Go to the jury room and return a verdict when you come back of not guilty. Thank you. I mean Seventy-seven? No, one sixty up there. Okay. Let's talk about the facts. Let's talk about the <coughs> facts about which there can be absolutely no dispute. Okay. Nancy Van Susten falsified her calendar. Nancy Van Susten falsified her calendar. Fact for which there is no dispute. Nancy Van Susten told the F. B I that she had a stop order. Nancy Van Susten told you that she had a stop order.
look at exhibit 3A. And you have to agree with me that what we've proven in this case is that when Nancy Van Susten falsified her calendar, she lied. Now, if I could get exhibit 177, please. 177. It's the, yes, thank you. So this is the blue sheet. This is where you record whether a trade is made pursuant to stop loss order. And there is no check, which means that that trade was not made pursuant to a stop loss order. So that is the proof that when Nancy Van Susten told the FBI that she had a stop loss order, she lied. That is the proof. When you go back in the jury room, take out Exhibit 11 and look at it. There is no check next to pursuant to stop loss order. It is plain English. It is simple English. It is not hard to understand. There is no check because there is no stop loss order. And so when Nancy Van Susten told you she had a stop order, she lied. And that's what she's charged with in this case. Return the only verdict that speaks the truth, the only verdict that speaks justice. Guilty. Thank you. All right, we will see you tomorrow morning.